Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 565, the family edition. I'm Kevin Carlson. I'm George Conger. I'm Gavin Ashland, and it's Friday, the 10th of January, 2020. All right, welcome to another program of Anglican Unscripted, where we cover deep theology. That's what we have Gavin and George for. We cover things uh, that happen in the Church of England. We have uh, and around the Anglican Communion, and this is going to be one of those days where we get to delve into uh, uh, Gavin's past as the chaplain to the Queen without getting uh, too much into the weeds, because, well, you're going to find out in a minute. Before we get there, please subscribe to the channel. We need you to uh, give us your feedback, which you're doing in spades. I can't believe how the comment section has just taken off the last few months. If Really, if you're not part of the comment section, you're probably not part of the show and you need to be there. Uh, you need to subscribe to the show. I looked on the Google Analytics for YouTube and it said only 50% of viewers to Anglican Unscripted, of which there are thousands, actually subscribe to the show. You need to do this. You, you gotta be part of the Anglican Unscripted Theos. And to do that, you click on that little red uh, rectangle button, a little bell pops up. Do you want instant notifications? Yes, I want the instant notifications. We have a podcast also that uh, is the audio version of what happens here for those people who need to listen to us in the cars because they're busy priests and clergy and they're just going all over the world. You can listen to us on your phones. You do that by clicking on the link and subscribing in the show notes. I think I covered everything. Oh, like us too on Facebook, YouTube. The little thumbs up means you love us. And we know you do. It's okay. Um, you can't pick your family. That's that's really how we're going to start this off. Um, and we're going to give you a story here that makes your family seem really normal. You just got back from Christmas. You're just like, I can't believe I belong to this family. No, 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 no. Let us tell you about the royals and uh, some of what's been happening more recently. Yeah, certainly you guys remember the King's Speech. You guys remember uh, kind of the how they slant towards making bad decisions every once in a while. And we have kind of the kicker of all bad decisions from Harry and Meghan, who've decided to not be part of the royal family anymore, but keep their titles and keep their money. And I thought we could uh, delve into at least what we know so far. It's still a breaking story. Right now, I just read there's negotiations going on between uh, Harry and Charles and, um, uh, Pierce Morgan says they should be punished for this, and the Queen uh, says stuff off the record. So, when the Queen speaks, Gavin, it's serious. So, <laughs> let's talk a little bit about. Uh, they're not abdicating uh, anything yet, but uh, they want to uh, keep as much as they can and not have any duties. George was about to say something interesting, weren't you, George? Oh, yeah, George, yeah. Well, I was going to say that uh, for those who have eyes uh, to see, uh, at the Queen's Christmas speech, uh, it was remarked that uh, Harry and Meghan's photo was not among the family photos on the Ooh. desk. So there must have been some undercurrents before Christmas because the photo was tastefully withdrawn from this is my family. Uh, so it, it would have been more interesting if it were the, the photo was turned over on the desk. <laughs> <laughs> but George is exactly right. One of the things that I discovered in the bath last night, uh, there's a, I don't have television, but I, I do watch um, uh, Sky uh, political commentators commenting on the front pages of the newspapers. And I, so I discovered in the bath last night that uh, this has been going on since before Christmas, which we didn't know. We, we thought it was just Harry and Meghan coming back off their holiday and making snap decisions. But there's been, but, but George is right. Um, there's been some negotiation between Harry uh, and his father uh, and his grandmother for the last two weeks. Um, so they did lose patience and they did press a nuclear button but because they weren't getting what they wanted in negotiations. I think, well, I, well but go on, Kevin. Before we get into the weeds, can you describe quickly kind of the, the life of a senior royal? You know, what are their duties uh, day to day? Well, um, you're right about not getting into the weeds. I was about to say that in the same way that we're going to suggest there is a, uh, a, 
a scale with royalty at one end and celebrity at the other um we too as we comment could either comment on the, on the gossip bits or try and do an act of discernment so i mm. i think getting into the weeds is getting stuck with a cost with the gossip and you're right to direct us towards discernment so be before getting onto the royal let me say that the real disservice was done by by michael curry at the, at the wedding when he preached a sermon saying uh when he preached john lennon all you need is love and what they've discovered is what we said at the time that's so wrong uh, what they needed is jesus i don't mean that as a kind of evangelical cliche i mean because the values of a senior royal of the royal family where it, in a way that now works are, are so much based on christian theology the, the primary value is about self-denial and duty and service for others and so the queen above all and all the senior royals um, they behave like celebrities without ego in other words that they, they behave like celebrities they go amongst the people the people are thrilled to see them but they reflect back onto the people so this becomes a kind of civic identity that we're all involved in where everybody is re-motivated with a kind of vision whereas what the celebrity does i think is to exercise a, a degree of narcissism and say look this is all about me how lucky you are to have anything to do with me and so we have this these two values one is to do one is much more based on christianity self-denial putting the other first duty rather than pleasure and the other is uh, much more than me generation self authentication authentication and poor Harry and Meghan don't know much about the Christian virtue <clears throat> uh, Archbishop Welby didn't manage to teach them much about the gospel when he baptized Meghan and that's not just a, a, a mean um, repost that's well, you, you said was Curry really... I think it was Welby who baptized I'm so sorry. I, I often yeah, misspeak. That's as people, right. as people point out in the comments, <laughs> I only do it to give people something to say in the comments. That's right. <laughs> Archbishop, <laughs> Archbishop Welby should have. We wish he could have, uh, and had had, explained something about the gospel to Megan because it would have helped her. But instead, we have we have a huge generational divide. We have effectively Harry and Megan saying, "We want to be celebrities, not not royals. We want to develop." our needs meet our needs not the needs of a wider community there was a, a big um vox pop outside buckingham palace i think yesterday on on some youtube and a reporter went round asking people are you for the queen or for megan <laughs> and and divided long age people under 30 said megan wow. and, and people over 30 said the queen and I think what we're faced with is is not only this divide between uh, unselfish capacity for for the kind of love that puts the other person first, um, but but a generational difference because the younger generation don't know much about the different uh, what Lewis called the four loves, but we'll call today the two loves, uh, duty and celebrity. So they're they're in trouble. I if I if I might uh, jump in, I, I would say. Gavin has perfectly summarized uh, the situation in my mind, but I would take issue with saying this is not something that has occurred in the current time. This was the problem with the Prince Regent who became George the Fourth. This was the problem with Edward, Prince of Wales, who became Edward the Eighth. This was the problem of Diana, of uh, and except for Diana, that the first two were born into this and were trained into this, but the ethos, the understanding that to those whom much has been given, much is expected, and that you are you are not king, but you are, if you will, the crown, and mm -hmm. sort of an absolute misunderstanding of their purpose and role in place. And it is a confusion with celebrity, with wealth, uh, and the uh, gift of... Uh, kingship which is as gavin said is so intrinsically tied and understanding i mean one one of the uh, up until i think it was uh james uh charles ii the uh king uh believed in the holy they, they taught right. the holy touch, right. the, holy touch the, yes. king, yeah. the king had the gift of healing uh now 
for some people may say, well, that's only from the Lord of the Rings, where Aragorn could touch you and you would be healed. <laughs> no, that was part of the understanding of the gift of kingship. That's what <clears throat> Monday Thursday, you know, the Monday, you know, the King's Monday at Royal Monday is all about. <clears throat> but may I just say that one of the reasons why the Lord of the Rings is so popular is because Tolkien was effectively using this myth but drawing on all the Christian archetypes, <clears throat> which then carried off and span into a different story. So, I mean, Aragorn only has it because the king of England had it. Um, and, and one of the things people don't understand, and they're very exciting if they did, is the extraordinarily moving uh, prophetic imagery that the coronation service contains. And one of the things the coronation service does, which is more than... than, than, than um, some denominations do without getting into that is to draw this long continuous line from the old testament through to the new testament we might we might discuss about this continuity later on when we get to badly badly dressed preachers george but, but we're talking again about this element of 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 the un, the unfolding of theological continuity where um where where anointing and prophecy in the old testament flow through to uh, a more general anointing and prophecy for the whole body of Christ. But in the Old Testament, as in monarchy, it's concentrated in one individual on behalf of everybody else. I don't think what we're talking about is limited to the younger royals. It's a generational thing we find here with millennials and Gen Xers. Uh, the average person who I subcontract, who subcontracts, subcontracts with me in my business, is a 30 year old who still lives at home with mom in the basement. They do a little work for me. They play video games, they eat pizza, wash, rinse, repeat. And you're describing uh, Prince Andrew, of course, except, uh, <laughs> he's not in his 30s. <laughs> he's not in his 30s. But, you know, there's this generational uh, divide now where kids stay with their parents longer and they don't find the necessity to go out and. Uh, get a job, be successful, uh, finish a good ed education beyond uh, French art of the, of the Middle Ages uh, and get a doctorate in it and can't find a job. So I think it's something we're going to see more and more of, not just at the royal level. Oh, this never on. happens. <laughs> <laughs> I can I edit out the pause. to work. I still think that um, although it's traditional for people, for men our age to complain about the youth, I think the yes. gap between the old and the young, which was always bad, is much, much worse today from a Christian point of view because of the way in which the normal language of Christian sacrifice doesn't really appear as part of the under 30 narrative. Uh, you have to be brought up by Christian parents or perhaps by Buddhist parents, um, uh, but, but certainly by people who have an ethic that goes deeper than materialistic hedonism that our culture is steeped in today. Now, I, I don't want to do comparisons because what do I know, but if you, you can compare the public uh, demeanor of, of Princess Anne. Uh, she, she'd be, a, or even uh, the, uh, the wife, uh, Catherine, the 38-year-old uh, wife of the future Prince of Wales and King of England, they do a remarkably good job of modeling the behavior that the Queen has sort of shared of sacrifice. Of now Everybody slips, everybody falls. I'm not saying these are perfect people, but they get it. So, I mean, and Meghan Markle is the same age as her sister-in-law, Yet their uh, worldviews, their ethos are just completely different. So, it, uh, yes, it's generational, but at the same time, I think there's a character issue here. Well, Irby Royal, I can think of, has some scandal in the background, but they seem to learn from it. They learn to get back in line. There's some degree of forgiveness involved from the senior royals and says, yep, we understand. We've done it ourselves. Sorry. You know, get back to work. Can Harry and Meghan at all walk this back? Is there any way that they can be forgiven and say, oh, well, we did that stupid 30-year-old thing where we want to uh, uh, have our cake and eat it too. Is there forgiveness at a senior royal level in this? 
I, I just before answering that, I'd like to say it's not just every royal who has scandal without um, oh, wanting right. yeah, to turn this into sure. sort of pe penitential <laughs> Me Too campaign. Uh, we we all get on our knees because we all have scandal inside mm -hmm. our heads, if, if, even if it's not acted out. And the way back is 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 Jesus and forgiveness. And one of the reasons why we're trying to be so explicit about the gospel is we want everyone to have a way back from their scandal and their failure. Um, but can the can they can Harry walk this back? I I think almost certainly not. There isn't any sense of self awareness in any of um, the conversations that they've had in public. Uh, both, uh, well, I don't want to be rude about Harry and Meghan, but but to, to do it, they would have to come out in public and say we've made a terrible mistake. We want to um, sublimate our egos to the common project of royalty and what royalty can achieve when it puts moral pro projects and values before its own self-interest. Uh, I think they certainly see the value of charitable acts, but, but again, there's a fear that they might see charity as a way of adorning their egos rather than a thing for its own self. What, what, what right do I have to say that? I don't know. It, I, I don't think they're going to be able to come back and say, we're sorry, we made a mistake. I'm afraid I think that two things will happen. One is there'll be pride and, 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 and hurt there, and they'll find it as difficult as anybody does to say we were mistaken. But the other is they'll encounter a certain ruthlessness at the heart of the royal family um, in order to survive, because not many royal houses have done. One of the things that the royal family has done is to have some very competent advisors who say, in order to survive, you're going to have to make these radical surgical changes. The one huge one happened after Diana's death, when the Queen got it wrong herself very badly. I think the Queen will let Harry and Meghan go pretty quickly. The only question is whether they give them much money to take with them. I'm uh, now. I'm not talking uh, morality. I'm talking the the media because I I may know a bit about more than the one than the other. Um, the knives are starting to come out very quickly for uh, Harry. Uh, I've seen on Twitter little photos comparing uh, pictures of uh, a man named Hewitt, who was uh, Princess oh, Diana's yeah, riding yeah. instructor, how he looked at a certain age. So the so the meme is resurfacing that he's not actually Charles's son. I have no knowledge. That's cruel, unkind, but the it's being pulled out again. Uh, Harry is in danger of what I call a Kevin Spacey. Kevin Spacey was one of the giants of the acting world. That he did something. I'm not saying it's any way comparable. He, he was accused of. He was accused of something. I'm not saying what he was accused of is comparable to Harry. But whatever it was, when you live in the world of celebrity, it can. It's there's no permanence there. It can turn on a dime. So that now that Kevin Spacey is a non-person in the world of celebrity, that can happen to Harry uh, if he and Meg will pursue the celebrity route and they make a false step. Whereas if, you know, oh well, I think well, I, you know. I, well. Let's talk a little bit about, about the tabloid world here too. Tabloids in America are nothing like the tabloids of England. Uh, the tabloids of England are, are just set the standard, the bar so high for false news, false reporting, blowing things way out of proportion following uh, royals uh, you know out to the tennis club taking all the little pictures and stuff like that uh, you know a a tabloid over there is just salacious compared to anything we have here in, in America if, think, if Harry and Meghan think that they were getting a bad shake from the red tops which is the general term for tabloid papers it's going to you know they've been trademarking the uh, Duke, Duke and Dus Duchess of Sussex name and trying to basically preparing their but financial empire with uh, all sort of the branding that would come with it. If you think that uh, they've had a bad time now, just wait till uh, the red tops start to go after them on money and this and that and the other. It's just going to be messy. Okay. <clears throat> the temptation for them is to think, the temptation is to think that they're popular because of some virtue that they have. Um, my comparison wouldn't be Kenneth Spacey, it would be Gwyneth Paltrow. Gwyneth Paltrow was, was, was very beautiful and very attractive. Uh, and as she grew uh, less beautiful, uh, she began to express her opinions. And her, her opinions <laughs> turned out to be so awful 
that 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 only a certain thin percent of the population find her an inspiration anymore. I think the problem for Har you know Har Harry's a very nice man, but he's turned his back on his friends. Uh, and what does he have apart from his connection with royalty? Well, if he cuts himself off from that, um, he he won't he won't have very much. I mean, I suppose in the sense the same thing is true of me. I've traded hugely on being a former royal. Well, I haven't done it on purpose, but but it's been there to make to make use of. A any connection with royalty. Um, is something that people are interested by. The moment you think that you deserve it, um, and you misuse it, then uh, you're you, you're in danger of discovering that the bubble pops. And I'm afraid if if Meghan isn't doesn't prove to be a really good actress or an immensely competent facilitator for charities for uh, poor people, and Harry doesn't turn out to make something on his own bat. They may just disappear because the virtue is not theirs; it's borrowed. Oh, Edward, Edward the Eighth, the, the Prince, the Prince of Wales, Edward the Eighth, didn't die until the late nineteen sixties, and he was a fixture on the uh, cocktail party circuit of a certain stratum of society for thirty years. Yet he was, and for all intents and purposes, a non-person, yeah. and and. This may be the fate of the of the Sussexes. Yeah, sad reality. Let's move on. We just gave fifteen minutes to the Royals. We don't need to do that every week. <laughs> We're not tabloid. I hope so. I big news now is uh, evangel evangelist uh, Francis Chan has discovered the Eucharist a liturgy. And some of my favorite books in my library are the evangelicals who've kind of come over, the uh, uh, Robert E. Weber's and sort who are starting to do the Canterbury Trail. And I thought this is interesting, not because all of a sudden uh, Francis Chan got deep theology, but like many people, they do a nice long sermon and they end up in the weeds of liturgy. And that's kind of what I think happened here and I hope he continues on that road to can uh, the, kind of the Canterbury Trail. Uh, have you guys read the story? <laughs> the Canterbury Trail. It's the Roman Trail. No, <laughs> no. <laughs> we can argue about that later. George has some George has some excoriatingly interesting views about liturgical dress, which probably belong at this point. Yes, yeah, right. <laughs> well, Francis Chan is a popular uh, non-denominational preacher in the United States. He's uh, even evangelical with a small e, and he gave us a sermon, and it went viral because in the sermon he appeared to be saying that he believed in the real presence. Now, he did not define it in such a way as to say he was a believing in transubstantiation, but what he did was he displayed an, a, a lack of knowledge about church history. He said, I've just discovered that until the Reformation for 1500 years, the church taught universally this one theory of the real presence. No. Uh, it, like... by what we, in other words, <laughs> and then he went on to say, and I just learned that for the first time that it was the reformers who made, put the pulpit in the middle of the church. And, and so in other words, what Chan has done is that he's discovered rather late in his ministerial career, he's discovered the patristic fathers and he may be on a faith journey, I don't know where it's taking him, but he's sort of picking and choosing third-hand bits from the fathers that is sort of paving his current thinking. And using the patristic fathers is like using the Bible in the sense that you have people who have an idea, then they find what they want to say in the Bible. Mm -hmm. I had colleague classmates at seminary who were as kooky as kooky could all get out. They would read Jack Spawn's latest book with such enthusiasm. And when we took the patristics class, when they would read Origin, oh my goodness, this is it. And they never cracked another patristic scholar after that. And they only had little snippets of Origin. People, you, And so what Francis Chan is doing is from a lack of knowledge, from a lack of rigor of preparation and and just terrible dress sense. I mean, come on now, wearing a plaid shirt with not tucked into your pants and preaching. I'm sorry, skinny jeans and $500 sneakers. Oh my goodness. You, know, you are offending made... the Lord, the holiness of God, but it is, but 
here we go. Rick Warren so made Hawaiian shirts famous again. <laughs> <laughs> this is where we need Kevin to referee the tennis match that we're about to have because <laughs> I, I, um, George, here's my return shot. There was there was a good serve right down the line, something of an ace. However, is the glass half empty or half full? Um, you, I'd like to return your half empty back with half full. Um, it's certainly true that the fathers are dangerous territory. Uh, I began to realize how difficult it was to remain in one's depth after I'd read both Origin and Tertullian and discovered how difficult they were and what enormous ground they covered, and how both of them were not exactly at the center of orthodoxy. But having said that, that that's the glass half empty. The glass half full bit is a very good many people are taught a version of church history that is uh, just intended to legitimize family quarrel. Uh, and when they go back and to discover what how, how the acorn grew into the oak, and they discover that the branches of the oak are entirely legitimate extensions of the early acorn, then some of the propaganda that comes out of the out of the Reformation begins to uh, be seen for what it is. And so while Chan was discovered, uh, what, uh, it didn't give the capacity to articulate a complex Eucharistic theology. But what he was astonished to discover was that from the age of the apostles onward, everybody believed that what happened to the bread and the wine was something supernatural. And that only stopped in the in the 16th century when people understanding the supernatural became shadowed by uh, a, a more rationalistic culture. Now, the, the trouble is what Chan had never understood was that, that the church had existed from... Um, uh, from Ignatius of Antioch and Polycarp of Smyrna uh, um, uh, right through to the 15th century was a church of immense spiritual vigor, profound authenticity that had evangelized the known world. And the difficulty is that the Protestant um, propaganda covers that up and undermines it. Now, it doesn't matter what, 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 where people choose to take their own stance, where they, whether they want to be nourished by Luther on the one hand, or by Augustine of Hippo on the other. That's a choice for all of us. But what we mustn't do is to misrepresent each other so you don't have access to Augustine or you don't have access to Luther. And I think Chan, for the first time, discovered that there was a whole load of church history that had been misrepresented to him. And and, and one of the things he was astonished was that I mean, there is a great danger in Protestantism that the pulpit takes the place of Jesus. In other words, uh, if I'm going to preach profound things about the gospel it's quite difficult we're back to royalty and celebrity again it's quite difficult to take to take the me out of the preacher and to make it all about jesus but but the eucharist is nothing to do with the celebrant it's so much about jesus it's very hard for a celebrant to become a celebrity <laughs> and i think what chan was discovering was that in the balance of presenting jesus the preacher can allow himself to become a celebrity and the fact of the mass was something of an antidote to that no. Uh, <laughs> I was going to say, short of going back all the way to Charles the Bald in the ninth century. <laughs> no, I mean, yes, Gavin, Gavin is absolutely right about uh, preachers uh, being subject to. Uh, but no, why I say no is Chan is uh, being presented a worldview that there are only two options for the Eucharist. One is a hyper Zwinglianism, which this is a memorial. Uh, nothing more, and then it's an emotional uh, experience. Correct. Or you have uh, the full Council of Tran Transubstantiation. Anglicans, uh, at the, in other words, they're, the, the, he's basically uh, being placed in his reading or whatever it is in a situation that there are only these two extreme options. Now, transubstantiation, uh, which is not the same thing as the real presence, Transubstantiation didn't come about until the eighth of the ninth century, and we can ninth go century. over the yeah. debates between was it Ragbertist and Retrem. I, 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 I'll pull those names out of my head. Charles and was only Ball. adopted as a doctrine of the church in the thirteen hundreds. And the, in other words, the, the Lutherans believe in the real presence. Calvinists believe in a real presence, but they don't believe in the same real presence. Anglicans have a Calvinist, if you look at our prayer book, understanding of the real presence. But that real presence is spiritual, that we may, as the prayer book says, that we may worthily receive, and that those who take and eat uh, who do not worthily receive are not actually receiving, so that it is different 
from the Catholic understanding that this bread is the body and blood, uh, the Anglican, Anglican thinking would not adopt the corporal. Now, what Chan is missing is a thousand years of the development of doctrinal Eucharistic theology. And he's been given it, uh, he's basically presenting it as a series of either or. <clears throat> and it is not, it hist you know, historically, that's wrong. It just. Okay. And no. <laughs> no. <laughs> Absolutely not. George, that's. Mis <laughs> have, a, have the ball back down the line. Um, you're 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 confusing the issue by by not acknowledging Aristotle. Um, so transubstantiation is all about Aristotle and trying to express a miracle in terms that are, are that fit into the categories of Aristotelian uh, philosophy. But um, it's not. It's okay. If if I said to you that when Jesus fed the five thousand, uh, he didn't do it with real food. You'd say no, that's that's nonsense. It it was real. They they ate real stuff, um, and it is not it is not transubstantiation. It is not Aristotle to say that the bread and the wine are really Jesus. We may not be able to say how they're really Jesus, but but the um, what what Chan is discovering is that the early church, from literally the moment when the first of the apostolic fathers said. This is the medicine of immortality. Not this. Not this is spiritually inspiring, but but this is. Oh, but then you have the problem of why didn't Augustine believe this? Why did you know, Gavin? You're you're picking. You're doing exactly what Chan has done. You're 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 taking modern uh, uh, concepts, placing them back, and you're basically well. Let's ignore this bit of Augustine for another bit of Augustine. Let's ignore this bit of the fathers for another mm -hmm. bit of the fathers. The Council of Trent definition of transubstantiation is as foreign to the fathers as is Francis Chan Swinglianism, and that's history, uh, Gavin. You can't, you can't, you can't, you can basically you can you can be uh, you can be partisan on this point, but you have to realize there's this development of doctrine. Now you can adopt the process that it's always been there, and it's just taken the centuries for us to understand it in its complexity. That that's a very good argument. But what you're doing is you're reading back into something that is not there. Okay, so I would say I was reading forward from something in order to discover what is there. So it's 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 starting at the acorn and seeing whether or not the developments from the acorn are legitimately connected to it. And what Chan has discovered is there was an acorn. That that's what that's what he's excited about. Now you and I can happily. I mean, I would so enjoy it. Uh, we could argue about Augustinian uh, Eucharistic No, we could theology. discuss. <laughs> We're not going to argue. We can discuss. <laughs> and particularly, it's it, it, it's it's morphing into Aristotelian <laughs> context. But I don't think that's I don't think that's the point. I mean, I I think that's where theologians begin to lose contact with the life of the church. I think more important is that that what Chan discovered was that he need that that the, for fifteen hundred years the church lived a. A, a supernatural life in the Eucharist that had been stripped away by the rationalism and and the and the spirituality of the 16th century. Now, how you describe that is really problematic. But this but is see, it's, it's see, a Gavin, you're, you're, well, what I hear you'd be saying, and so it, it probably needs to be mm -hmm. explicated. Not nicely you're put, take, by the way. You're, 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 <laughs> I understand you to be saying that the Zwinglian memorialist view is the view that is carried forward from the Reformation, whereas the Zwingliest view is not the view of Anglicanisms as represented in the Book of Common Prayer or of Lutheranism or the Reformed Calvinist tradition. All those would claim belief in the real presence, how it's defined is very di is different from the Trent definition. Okay. But what Chan, you know, is, what Chan, is, Chan is doing is saying, my tradition of uh, sort of Presbyterian Zwinglianism, which is a 19th century creation, is the Protestant tradition since the 15th century, 16th century. And, well, I think we both agree on the ignorance of Chan. But I think that he, uh, he, he uh, well, we're not going to resolve what happens huh. today no, but oh, let, let the uh, Eucharist. Gavin, uh, I'll give you uh, a minute here, and then I'll, I'll finish up with Kevin's wisdom here. 
Um, so let me let me throw into the mix that Luther believed in the bodily assumption of the Virgin Mary. Luther certainly had 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 a very high view of the sacraments of what happened at the mass, and Calvin and Zwingli had had lower views. So we have a spectrum. It's true. Um, and we could argue about where people sit on the spectrum. What I'm, what I was trying to do, um, perhaps not well enough, uh, was to to look at the to look at the spiritual implications of of the philosophical shift that took place in the 16th century, where the supernaturalism of the Christian experience at the hands of the Holy Spirit began to be unnecessarily constrained. Now, that's that's a you know, because I think it's unnecessarily constrained, uh, I want to buy into the whole lineal development from the time of the apostles. And I think that's what makes one a Roman Catholic, actually. And I can understand that if one doesn't want to buy into that linear development, but one thinks that something was rediscovered in 1520 that was either there in the New Testament or was certainly there uh, in the second century, you know, then one's a Protestant. But I don't think it is in the New Testament, and I don't think it was there in the second century. And that, that's why I don't buy into this new wisdom of the Reformation as it has become expressed. That's, that's my version of what I hear you saying. As it's become expressed in the denominational divide now. And it's so badly expressed that someone like Chang says, goodness me, I've been misled. I had no idea though, that, that the church believed in this supernatural act in the Eucharist. I'm delighted. This, this takes some pressure off me as a preacher. Praise well, the Lord. Let's let's find the areas of common. Thing. I think we we believe Chan is badly educated. <laughs> we do believe that his seminary was really. You know, he didn't take he, church history one hundred and one. He's badly dressed. Uh, uh, he. We believe that too. <laughs> I mean, I mean, next thing you do if we see him show up in a cassock alb. God help. <laughs> yes, well, I do. Please, please, please. And that uh, I think we both can celebrate the joy of his finding that there is a world of Christian thought and dialogue and understanding and history that are what has gone before. Gavin and so I may be sharply, our gas here. <laughs> you know, we, we may sharply be divided upon you know the ordering of events and the uh, conclusion of events, but we agree on the importance that this is a culmination of we stand upon the wisdom of two thousand years. Sure. Whereas Chan and pastors of his ilk reinvent the Bible every Sunday, or in my denomination, yes. they read the New York Times op-ed page and then go to church and preach from that. They don't have any. That, that was the thing with Catherine Jeffrey Shorey. Christianity began with her, and that's how she yes. operated. Kevin's so Chan wisdom. Is Kevin. It doesn't begin yeah. with him. I agree. Yeah, okay, okay. Ke Kevin's wisdom here. When we talk more about the Eucharist than participate in it, we're doing it wrong. Oh, can Just we talk? That, can, can we participate in the Eucharist as we talk about it? Well, the Eucharist see. was the, the I, Eucharist I, I was given to us to Sunday. yeah I know no, no. but the, the, so, so the four, Eucharist four and a half hours versus a half hour on this show so yeah. I guess I'm doing well you, you're good you're both good the Eucharist was given to us to bring us together so mm. I've I read so many books about uh, uh, the real presence versus transubstantiation versus this versus that. Um, and I think we as a whole church need to again get together and discuss where we agree on it and what we agree on it. Yeah. So. But see, I don't agree with that. I don't <laughs> believe it brings us together. If if you mean by us the communion of saints, it's about Jesus. It's not about us. Amen. Absolutely. It's it's not about. In other words, this is this is my beef with Justin Welby. Let's gather together. Let's celebrate the Eucharist. Let's forget that we don't believe the same things are happening, that we don't believe the same ethical issues, that Christianity is a form of Freemasonry, whereas Christianity is about the worship and glory uh, given due and due to, to God. It's not about us. It's not about fellowship. It's about God. Jesus. Yeah. I wish I could. I wish I had a very insightful way of, of squaring the circle that George and Kevin have expressed. Um, I, I think the only thing I've can find it sensible to myself to say is that in our search of Jesus what we're trying to do is to be 
is, is to live so faithfully that when we see other people misusing him, we want to protest. And I think the great genius of the Reformation was it saw the misuse of the Eucharist and there was a protest. I think that was quite right. Then the next thing is, is not to throw the baby out with the bathwater in, in, the, in, in the passion of the protest, not to make not to make Jesus inaccessible again. And I think that's what we're arguing about. We're arguing about the accessibility of Jesus and how we don't misuse him. Uh, and, and Kevin quite rightly says, in a spirit of Eucharistic encounter, we need to make sure that we do that gently with each other <laughs> in order that, and, that we find ourselves drawn close together than much further apart. And, in, and using Gavin's... Uh language gavin believes in taking a bath i believe in taking showers uh, we both we, need to we both believe in being clean that was good. <laughs> we, both, that was we good. both need to be clean but but the process by which so we good. are clean uh uh we uh, we understand it differently amen yes I, uh, what, 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 what the, the problem is when 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 i say to you your shower isn't working george <laughs> you tell me my bath water is too dirty to be helpful <laughs> that's the point of which it becomes acrimonious yes. but yeah, we both it, need to be clean we, uh, our generation would just uh, use the right guard to spray under the arms and move on gentlemen what a wonderful show people are going to well, love this it, show that's incense Kevin <laughs> yeah people are going to love this show you're right going to you're going to want to go to comments there's not one viewer who is not going to take an opinion on the Eucharist who's not going to want to go to the comments. Tell us where we're right. Tell us where we're wrong. Don't troll. This is not this is not Trollville. But uh, continue the show there. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. I'm Kevin Ashton, and I'm looking forward, especially in the comments, for help in getting myself from Augustinian, Aristotelian theology. And you've been listening to episode 565 of Anglican, rather full of ourselves, unscripted. Pray for us as we pray for you. Indeed. Indeed.